Well, welcome to the Bowling Point. Always good to see you. Glad that you spent some time with us. We've got Gerald Blaine. Appreciate you stopping by again. He's always uh, really anxious to get in front of the camera. Mm. Um, so uh, always like going out with Gerald um, when we talk about this particular subject. Uh, he's able to explain this in a very elementary way, and uh, we thought we'd share a little bit about combustion today. So, Drew, why don't you just talk a little bit about some of the things that uh, we do here at WARE and uh, how we actually explain combustion. Well, what I kind of wanted to talk about was uh, our customers in general, they, you know, they, they want their boiler to run. Mm -hmm. They look in, they see a flame, everything's good, steam's being made, and they don't work with it all day, every day but they just want it to run, so they don't necessarily know if there's a difference between one flame or the next. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I wanted to talk about as well. We'll get into some technology differences and how things have advanced over the years. But one of the things I wanted to get into, and I had some people a lot smarter than me put this together, and this is a, a, a typical situation. It would change, uh, furnace size might uh, change this a little bit, the type of burner might change this a little bit. for. But for conversation purposes, this illustrates a lot of good fundamentals regarding that all flames are not equal. Uh, because a lot of the things that are going on today, we talk about uh, FGR, uh, that means flue gas recirculating, and that's utilized a lot of times in order to lower NOx. Uh, everyone's got a lot of green initiatives out there to keep emissions down. And, but it, by and large, that has a, a, a negative effect and an efficiency effect on, uh, on your system. So I wanted to kind of talk about that and illustrate uh, how that can impact what we do day to day. Uh, a guy will typically look at, at his flame and say, oh, you know, it's nice and blue, it looks good. But that isn't how you define uh, flame quality. It might be a clean flame, and that's great, but it might be highly inefficient. And what I've got here is some curves uh, regarding flame temperature, and I didn't do this math, I had someone do some thermal calculations for me that's much smarter than I, uh, but this kind of goes over the fundamentals of what's actually going on in your boiler, what we want to uh, look for, what we want to avoid. Um, this first curve that we're looking at here is, is with zero FGR, and that's kind of where I'm going to base the conversation. So as you can see here, uh, as you add FGR, you're decreasing flame temperature. So let's talk about we don't have any FGR from the uh, beginning. A lot of people don't have new low NOx burners at this point. And what, what, what they're often going to see is we talk about uh, excess air uh, O2s, as an example, 15% uh, excess air uh, is a, almost 3% O2, and that's typical. And the engineering that usually happens with traditional equipment is that they're hitting 3% at high fire. Uh, the problem is, as you come down a, a typical firing range, you're going to see excess airs go up, excess air and the O2 level. So as an example, if we had 30% excess air and we're in a lower firing range, we're going to see a lower flame temperature, higher O2s, and you see us coming down the curve. Just going from 15 to 30%, we could see a drop close to 300 degrees in flame temperature. So I'm trying to illustrate here that all flames are not equal. And you can see as we add uh, flue gas recirculation, we lower those temperatures further. Often I'll see systems that might be 40 or 50 percent excess air getting up here into the 6 and 7 percent O2 ranges. And you can see where that can bring it down, you know, four, five, six hundred degrees in flame temperature. So all flames are not created equal. And the things we're wanting to avoid by understanding this is avoid flame quenching, which is what's occurring here with the lowering of the temperature which is necessary to some degree when we get into the NOx. But how much uh, flue gas we have to add is going to impact how efficient that particular system is, and not all low NOx are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in doing this too, we want to avoid furnace cooling. So if we lower our temperatures, we're increasing the air, now we've got our heat exchanger battling against us. Uh, and we want to avoid high velocities. A lot of systems, uh, traditional systems in particular, uh, they can use lower horsepower fans because the velocities are running through there quickly and the heat exchanger can't perform exactly like we'd like it. So by avoiding some of these things, we're looking for better heat transfer. We also want to look for less maintenance. So there's a lot of equipment out there that has fewer moving parts, and those are the kinds of things we're wanting to implement into our combustion system. But these are just some of the fundamentals that the average person who's 
not dealing with this kind of thing every day, simply looks in the peephole and goes, I got a flame, and why is your flame any different? And these are some of the characteristics that really cause that to be different. So how do you define efficiency? Well, not the way that most people do. Most people look at this and they say, oh, look, it's clean, it's blue, it's, it's efficient. Th those are totally different things. This could be a nice clean flame, but the way we define it is we define it by the numbers. And what we're wanting to have is low O2 operation because higher O2s mean a lot more excess air, that flame quenching that I was describing earlier. We want to keep the CO down as much as possible. And I'll explain how CO impacts uh, different uh, technologies here shortly. Uh, if you got oil, you know, we don't want a number uh, over one in smoke. And if we are utilizing a low NOx technology, we'd like to keep the flue gas recirculation or the FGR to a minimum because as I illustrated in the flame fundamentals, that can impact more flame quenching, more cooling of the furnace. Mm -hmm. Well, as far as like traditional burners, um, maybe talk a little bit about how they operate. What we have here uh, would be very traditional. You'll see there's tons of this technology out there right now. Uh, it's still being sold. Uh, it has been improved quite a bit over the years. It's a swirl head mixing technology. Um, but it has some limitations, uh, and they are working hard to improve it. Um, and what those things are is you don't always have a balanced uh, fuel air mix. So they utilize uh, throats and different tiles in order to try to make sure combustion gets completed. But when they have biases in different areas, they're trying to create chaos and cause the burning, but sometimes they'll have a bias. And the technician in the field, when that bias occurs, you get an elevation in CO. And that's unburnt fuel that can create uh, poisoning in the air, all kinds of things. So the technician is limited to how he's going to work with that, and it's often by increasing the excess air, the O2 levels. And a lot of the equipment uh, with the traditional technology still has linkages. This is uh, kind of what a typical linkage system would look like. You've got one motor trying to do multiple different things with all these arms. So it gets complicated, and if you added a secondary fuel into that, it's that much more complicated for the technician to get everything to work exactly right and still be safe. So then he has to buffer in some safety factors into that. So the way that we define uh, the, deficiency, or the efficiency with the traditional burner would look something like this. Uh, they would achieve 3% O2s at high fire, and then as you come down the firing range to the different rates, you would see an elevation in the excess air or the O2 levels. Also with the linkages you would be uh, more restricted particularly if you had dual fuels to maybe a four or a three to one turndown which is not necessarily good or bad it just depends on the circumstance and the situation. Uh, you, you could have a lot of uh, turndown capability and your process never use it. So we try not to make more out of that than it is. It's, it's application dependent. Uh, but what we do see overall and I see hundreds of these a year is we'll see that at the average capacity of the boiler, uh, when you compare its total ability to use fuel versus what it does, is in that 35% capacity range. So that's why you see there's a huge opportunity here uh, to save money if, if we could improve that situation. But this is what people were used to. That's typically the way uh, traditional burners were engineered. Like I said, they have made improvements. Uh, and they continue to try to improve that technology. Well, where do most boilers or burners actually run um, as far as a percentage of, of running? What we typically see is uh, the boilers being that they average 35 percent running in that 30 to 45 percent range and then occasionally you see them move up to high fire, come back down. Uh, but when we look at a profile it's often in this mid-range which is where we're wasting the fuel as you can see on the curve. So most boilers are just oversized? Uh, well, that's the challenge. Uh, the, the boiler itself has to be sized to handle maximum loads, right. but on normal working conditions it's not at the max. Gotcha. So you got kind of a catch-22 that you have to do it, but you waste fuel in the normal range. Okay. So we've got all this, um, I guess, old technology or traditional technology. Has there been any type of advances that actually... There, there have. Uh, and the guys working with the traditional technology have uh, recognized that there's a big advantage to parallel positioning systems. <clears throat> uh, what you end up with is you, a lot of them nowadays are touchscreen, not all. 
Uh, this one happens to be a touch screen. You can touch on all the different areas and get input back and forth. And what this will have in it, it'll have its own flame safeguard, so it's still doing the burner management. Mm -hmm. It'll have its own PID control, which is your proportional and your integral and your derivative movements. And, and what, what that is, is, is how fast do we move in order to get to a set point. So you have a lot of control over that, and we find that that piece of it alone can be 70% of the savings opportunity, mm -hmm. getting that right, staying on track. Um, and then you're set, instead of having all those little linkage arms that we saw in the previous uh, picture, you'll have a servo motor, and you'll put one on the fuel, and you'll put one on the air separately, so you're not trying to use one element to do multiple things. So we get a lot better control. You may even integrate a, uh, a trim system. Mm -hmm. This particular one uh, is a multiple trim system. It'll do CO, uh, CO2 and O2 instead of just O2. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could have one that just does O2. Uh, that could have some inherent problems of its own, but a lot of people use those. So with something like this, you've got your parallel positioning um, and you're really just making old technology as good as it possibly could be. So have there been any advances, I guess, on the, from a burner standpoint? Um, there are, and, and you bring up the good points, because when we define the parallel positioning on the older technology, what you end up getting, to your point, is uh, we maintain the engineering design that we can do at high fire, mm -hmm. and, and often the older technology without this will even deviate at the higher fire range. You'll see it move up to 4% O2. So we get that back to where it's supposed to be and we make an improvement on the curve. Okay. But the control system, as good as it is, is limited to what the burner's capable of. Mm. So that's where we end up. So because we're bound by that, uh, there are other things that have come out uh, to try to make some additional improvements. Mm. And that's going to like a premix technology. And, and what that does, uh, the easiest way to explain it that most people can understand, or at least people my age, younger people may not know what standard carburetors are, but you go from the traditional stuff being the standard carburetor to what most people drive today where they have a fuel injection system. So what you're doing there is you're incorporating not only let's put gas out there and, and make a chaotic mix like you would do in a traditional technology, you, you do that and you incorporate pressure and velocity to make sure you match up the O2 molecules with the combustion fuel molecules. And we get what we call about an 85% premix. And there we're a lot less uh, fuel dependent. Uh, so when we go to make our adjustments, it's a lot easier and a lot cleaner. Uh, we also utilize the parallel positioning system with this technology, but it's direct coupled to it. So it's designed to fit it real well. Uh, it's engineered to where you got a large eyelet, you can see what's going on, all the service can be done from the rear, where you see uh, anything can be moved in and out without taking the uh, burner actually offline. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have all those imbalances, those biases that we have to clean up with the air. We got a good retained flame on the head, and we don't have a bunch of refractory that we would have to deal with. Mm. We simply pack in around the cone to keep any heat from hitting it, but it does not become part of the combustion process. In a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, furnaces in the boilers, you might take up several feet of the furnace with this refractory that mm. cracks and breaks and you have to deal with that and you're blocking a good heating surface that doesn't get used in the furnace. Mm. So that definitely is uh, some of the bigger improvements. Yeah, big advantage there with the refractory. And this kind of, uh, so the way we define it when we get to this premix technology is we end up flattening out the curve. We, we sit uh, at that 3% or actually even better in most cases. And then we improve the turn down uh, to some degree, six, eight to one. We get in that 12% range and sometimes even more. What we don't want to have happen is we don't want the flame uh, turning around and sitting on the head and burning up. It's not uncommon that someone will set up uh, particular retrofit and it'll uh, be turned down too low and then it burn out the head. So we mm -hmm. make sure that we've got the flame on the right side of the combustion head and if we have to air it out slightly, unlike where I've seen a lot of conditions where they say, yeah, we want 8, 10 to 1 turn down and they're up here in the 8, 10 percent O2, which is 60 percent excess air and we got the flame quenching, we're cooling the furnace, 
we're doing everything against the process. Where when we get a call for heat and we're running at these low O2 levels, we're not creating CO, we immediately started making steam. It comes, it goes straight from the flame into the, through the furnace into the water. Instead of having to uh, ramp, ramp up into the low O2 range before we start getting good production. So what you'll see with this change in technology is that you'll get a call for heat, you'll ramp up real high, and then you'll come back down causing an over and under shooting where we will tend to modulate, we'll go up because more heat's available, and then we'll come down uh, slower and sooner mm. because you're gonna get heat immediately. This is an example of what a pre-mix system might look like. Uh, I talked about that eyelet. Normally, uh, most traditional equipment, you got a small eyelet, you can't see much of what's going on. Mm -hmm. But since the design of this kind of equipment is to actually service it from the eyelet, you remove the bolts, pull it out, uh, there's not a lot of moving parts, so we really don't do, there's not a whole lot of servicing that goes on. Uh, but this is a typical example of what that might look like. What are some typical performance numbers that we're talking about with this? Good question, and, and here's an example, and this one happens to be a low NOx look, because in most cases, low NOx will mean less efficient. Uh, with the premix technology, we still maintain the uh, sub 3% O2 across the board. You can see here, not creating any CO. Mm -hmm. This one happens to be about an 8, 10 to 1 turndown, uh, and we're achieving the 30 or less ppm all the way across the board. So we're not getting a big flame quenching, we're getting the knocks we need, we're getting efficient. So we're trying to combine all of those things and not just say knocks or nothing, but we're do it, getting it efficient. We're usually saving 14, 15 plus percent in fuel by utilizing these kinds of technologies. And we do it on a regular basis. So we've retrofit about every kind of equipment there is out there. So we know it's proven. We've got hundreds in the field. Um, so we're real excited about it. We even buy it ourselves now for our own equipment. Well, we appreciate you stopping by, man. Uh, always great information. And uh, hope you uh, learned a little bit about some older technology and some of the newer technology. We'll see you next time.